So I'm going to continue reading from Art and Fear by David Bales. I'm just going to start off where I left off, which uh, is Art Issues. Okay. It seems harmless enough to observe here that living in MFA, or even a knowledge of modern art, should hardly be a prerequisite of making art. After all, art appeared long before art departments, long before anyone began classifying or collecting artists' works. Nonetheless, most artists today do have formal training in art, a familiarity with the current art world trends, and at least some dependence on galleries or academia for their livelihood. This is understandable, if not exactly healthy, given that each link in the artist's network has a vested interest in defining its own role as fundamental and necessary. One of the ordinary problems artists face is finding a way to make peace with the arts network and the issues it holds dear. Not necessarily joining it, mind you, just making peace with it. At least you need to, if you want assurance, your work will be likely shown, published or performed in any reasonable length of time. If the need to get shown is strong enough, this is not a problem. But the unease many artists feel today betrays a lack of fit between the work of their heart and the emotionally remote concerns of curators, publishers and promoters. It's hard to overstate the magnitude of this problem. Finding your place in, art, in the art world is no easy matter, if indeed there is a place for you at all. In fact, one of the few sure things about the contemporary art scene is that someone besides you is deciding which art and which artists belong in it. It's been a tough century for modesty, craftsmanship and tenderness. When I read tenderness, I immediately think of tender loving care. <laughs> TLC. <laughs> that was not so good with the sign language. Anyway, I tried. Um, next heading. That was a short one. Competition. I'm actually very interested to know what this has to say. There's no denying competition. It's hardwired into us. It's chemical. Good athletes bank on, the, on that surge of energy that arises in the instant of knowing they can overtake the runner just ahead. That is true. Fun fact. I was an avid athlete um, back, back uh, in the old age time. Um, <laughs> so I know how that feels. Also, um, <clears throat> during training and... Um, Sure, during competitions as well, but especially during training where you are sort of warming up, you're running, you're um, doing all these exercises um, and uh, you're kind of pushing a little bit beyond your limits and you're then sort of taking it easy, then you're sort of sort of grinding and then you're going beyond and then you, hit, you at some point you do some like rounds and... Uh, or so, like certain sprints or whatever, and you're basically practicing this, and um, you can achieve a flow state from that. I promise you. I swear. Like there's, there is a video somewhere that I saw that backs that up. I think, um, or yeah, yeah Google it. That, that is true. Um, I think that's why people love running so much because they do hit that flow state at some point. Um, I'm not sure about walking, I, you know, I think with walking it's possible, especially if you apply some of um, John Viveki's uh, exercises while you're walking. Um, his meditative um, practices, uh, they can be incorporated in that. And if you're going for a walk and you walk in the park, in nature, that also helps. Um, and I also sometimes pair that with um, certain types of music. So on this thing, uh, this is vital um so that's like a whole experience and then i'll take photos as well sometimes i'll stop and take a photo or a video um basically because i've stopped to like marvel at um certain parts of the nature environment that i would be in so yeah that incorporates a couple of things anyway 
We find a place. Could artists thrive on exhibit and publication deadlines, on working 20 hours straight to see the pots are glazed and fired just so, on making their next work better than their last? The urge to compete provides a source of raw energy, and for that purpose alone, it can be exceptionally useful. In a healthy artistic environment, that energy is directed inward to fulfill one's own potential. In a healthy artistic environment, artists are not in competition with each other. Unfortunately, healthy artistic environments are about as common as unicorns. Okay. We live in a society that encourages competition at demonstrably vicious levels and sets a hard and accountable yardstick for judging who wins. That is true, unfortunately. Um, it's easier to rate artists in terms of the recognition they've received, which is easily compared than in terms of the pieces they've made, which may be as different as apples and waltzes. And when that happens, competition centers not on making work, but on co collecting the symbols of acceptance and approval of that work. NEA grants a show at Galerie du Jour a celebrity profile in The New Yorker, and the like. Taken to extreme, such competition slides into the needless and often self-destructive comparison which the fortune, with the fortunes of others. W.C. Fields became enraged at the mere mention of Charlie Chaplin's name. Milton suffered lifelong depression from ongoing self-comparison with Shakespeare. Solieri went a bit more insane each time he compared his music's music sorry that was a mistake to Mozart's and who among us would welcome that comparison fear that you are not getting your fair share of recognition leads to anger and bitterness fear that you are not as good as a fellow artist leads to depression Admittedly, few of us are f few of us. Oh my legs going to die. <laughs> a few of us are, are above feeling a momentary stab of pain when someone else wins the fellowship we sought, or a secret rush of triumph when we scoop up the same prize. Kingsley Amos allowed that when he'd start writing a new novel. Part of his motive was. I'm going to show them this time. But occasional, occasion, where is, my goodness, I'm so sorry, this is, bad. <laughs> the mistake's hectic, wow, sure, it's okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. But occasional competitive grousing is a healthy step removed from equating success with standing atop the bodies of your own peers. If nothing else, it's hard to claim victory when your imagined competitors may be entirely unaware of your existence. After all, some may have already been dead for a century. Quite plausibly, they don't win, while you, sooner or later, will lose. In some forms of comparison, defeat is all but inevitable. But regardless of the artistic use, all competitors share one telling characteristic. They know where they rank in the pack. Avid competitors check their ranking constantly. Obsessive competitors simply equate rank with self. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going into a tangent now. A chancy gambit, but one that works when it does work. By tapping a source of energy that makes them work harder at their art and almost always makes them good careerists. When sense of self depends so directly on the ranking bestowed by the outside world, motivation to produce work that brings high ratings is extreme. In not knowing how to tell yourself that your work is okay, you may have been driven to the top of the heap in trying to get the rest of the world to tell you. Oh, 
I experience that like if I have to link it to something that is of art um, I I could my mom was an artist and an art teacher and just anything to do with creativity and art yeah so I pr I'm pretty sure that I could mix colors before I could talk or walk probably um, <laughs> but uh, bless her heart uh, I, and I grew up and she always put me into art classes and then in high school um, there was an art uh, art history class or fine arts class but that had um, lapsed and they changed it into a um, design curriculum which um, in just included that but uh, had a lot more to it and it was probably one of the most stressful subjects and com competitive um, and uh, I, I'm definitely I was was I think I'm better now um, I was definitely one of those um, um, obsessive competitors and I achieved you know but like it is so true that it it, it would link to my self or my self worth that I had or my self esteem or my sense of self um, and uh, you know like that is that you know it, it works you know in terms of you know, you can achieve and things like that but it's a bit far when let's say you are aiming for, for perfection and let's say that's a hundred percent but no when I was younger it that wasn't the case it was hundred and ten percent then I you know I got into a state of mind where that was not good enough and uh, you know then it was like beyond perfection which is that's like alarm bells should go off at that point where that was where I was aiming uh, because I had heard um, yeah maybe my ears should have been closed but anyway I had heard that um, in some institutions you could uh, gain marks um, or extra percentage um, beyond the hundred um, so that's kind of like extra credit I think um, I'm not sure what yeah but all the translations of what I just said me um, or are. anyway so um, even though that class didn't do that I had that put like foot into my mindset and that did help me achieve um, and there were two other <laughs> people in the class and us three would we would compete um, and we would basically rotate each term or, or each season basically um, as like who's the top second and third um, and uh, yeah just just constant and then you know in terms of perfection okay that perfection I could do could get that and um, then you know it was aiming for beyond perfection um, and then it was like give it a, you know give it 110 percent give it 111 percent no 120 aim for that and that was where I you know, I didn't know it, but at that point, I was achieving, but I was, you know, really, like, burning a lot of energy in terms of, you know, like, that was bringing me closer and closer to a burn, burn out, which included um, things that, that were not so great, um, like depression, anxiety, you know, even certain thoughts, um, I also, you know, the self-destructive part after that, after you crack, and also after the perception of perfection is shattered because because of the truth, <laughs> um, you know, you fall down, 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 and then I, I turn to sort of coping skills. Well, I wouldn't say they're coping skills; they were just sort of self-destructive habits that um, I naively thought. Uh, um, a lot of, yeah I just I don't think I was thinking at all to be honest um, and then you know then after that like other things started affecting other things in my life um, as well and um, even though I could still achieve you know there was 
yeah, after things were done um, and uh, like we could break for holiday you know I would like just collapse you know um, I would be so tired and so burnt out and then you know and and you know everything would drop and uh, yeah um, but it's not, a, it's not necessarily a sad story there was a lot there's a lot of good things that came from that skills and knowledge and things like that like that um, and I'm very glad that you know that my idea um, of perfection perfection in terms of like achievement and like under the surface that was what I didn't know is that it was affecting my self um, or my sense of self or you know just think of the spectrum around that and that's it affected me um, and uh, I didn't know how bad you just don't you know um, so that's one of those difficult things but I am I'm grateful for the fact that like the like perfection that it like just broke that perfection broke because what I was also sort of aiming for in uh, like indirect way is just sort of started forming um, were really weird things and that is like regarding let's say subjects such as anorexia body image um, sense of worth as well um, but that's the story for another day um, and uh, I'm planning to try and write a little something so that I can speak of that but anyway so um, you know who you are <laughs> when we did a you know I posted something about perfection over progress oh, and sorry that was a mistake progress over perfection um, meaning that that you should aim for making progress not aim for perfection and when I try to sort of explain it a little more from that is that perfection isn't real you know um, and uh, I'm just gonna leave that statement on a cliffhanger okay um, what makes competition in the arts a slippery issue is simply that there is rarely any consensus about what your best work is moreover what's important about each new piece is not whether it is better or worse than your previous efforts but the ways in which it is similar or different so sure. the meaningful comparison between two Bach fugues are is not how they rank but how they work when things go really well in your art making all the pieces you have you you make have a life to them regardless of how they stack up as personal favorites after all, they're all your babies. It can even be argued that you have an obligation to explore the possible variations, given that a single artistic question can yield many right answers. I'm going to read that again. It can even be argued that you have an obligation to explore the possible variations given that a single artistic question can yield many right answers. Productive see, times encourage you to build an, extend, an extended body of work, one where all the pieces, even the flawed sketches that will never see the gallery wall, have a chance to play. In healthy times, you really pause to distinguish between internal drive, sense of craft, the pressure of a deadline or the charm of a new idea. They all serve as sources of energy in the pieces you make. Oh, okay. Third one and then I'll, I'll be done. Navigating the system. Artists, as it turns out, are a crafty lot and surprisingly adept at getting the system to foot the bill for letting them do exactly what they wanted to do anyway. Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel on commission from the church and saw Adam photograph Moonrise Hodandes on assignment for the Department of the Interior. Ames, furniture and evident fashion spreads 
spreads prove that art can prevail even at the extremes of commerce and fluff. Indeed, a disconcertingly strong argument can be made for the proposition that many artworks, especially large-scale efforts like the Parthenon or the Vietnam War Memorial, have had a buyer in place before the artwork has begun. The problem is to keep such command performances from tainting the work that follows. Since commissioned art has a way of sliding slowly and imperceptibly into commercial trade. This is especially troublesome for the for art forms that have widespread and higher paying commercial applications. The challenge in such circumstances is to convince the patron that you alone know the right way to make the piece. For some artists, it's a trade-off, or perhaps a standoff. At Christmas time, ba ballet companies, even the, ma even the major players, offer an inordinate number of performances of the Nutcracker. That being the only ballet that generates enough ticket sales to pull them through the rest of the season. Likewise, printmakers, without altering the content of their work, learn soon enough which images will likely justify the cost of running a large edition. For many other artists, however, the art network prov proves an unmitigated disaster. Sometimes it's just the freewheeling thought patterns that lead to art making, don't lead as gracefully to tidy record keeping. More often, though, the same artists who diligently follow a self-imposed discipline, like writing in iambic pentameter, pentameter or composing a solo piano, prove singularly ill-equipped to handle constraints imposed by others. Edward Weston's well-meaning friends once convinced a coffee company to offer that artist a commission just this sentence here to make anyway still life photographs they could use in their magazine ads about the only requirement was that the company's product appear somewhere in the arrangement nonetheless weston whose whose facility with photographing small objects as an art is legendary was driven to complete distraction by the pressure of having to make one of those small objects a coffee can. Ideally, at least from the artist's viewpoint, the arts network is there to handle all those details not central to the art making process. This is a healthy attitude to nurture since some art forms like cinema and literature could never make the leap from idea to reality without a sizable investment from the outside anyway. Writers routinely mail out manuscripts and leave virtually all that follows, proofreading, design, printing, distribution, and promotion in the publisher's hands. Some artists even make the interface a prominent part of their work. Christo's various wrappings are a form of performance art experienced directly by the relatively few people, but the record of performance has become its own art piece, exhibited in museums, complete with maps, working drawings correspondent with zoning boards, logistical plans, and so on. If all this evidence of the reach of today's art network still fails to impress you, consider the sobering corollary, once you're dead, all your art is handled by this network. But if the artist stands as an endangered species in the face of contemporary economics and marketing, we are faced with the perplexing question. Why does the myth of an individual artist, the loner following his or her own heart, arise so predictably with, with each new generation? One possible answer is suggested by looking at the things that have made art worth doing in the past. Work that was driven by issues arising from the relationship between the artist and the work, or the artist and the materials, or the artist and the subject matter, rings true. Such work, regardless of whether it fits 
with then contemporary attitudes seems to continue to make sense over time. A second answer, more tentative, taps into the deep wellsprings of art, utility and ritual. In very early times, these basic needs provided the cultural niche for art, while self-expression, even if unrecognized as such, served to interrogate personal experience and skill with those larger goals. But ritual, which took for form as painted bison on the cave wall and found its higher flowering in the time of the great religions, has receded into secular fad and decoration, and utility, in whose service the early artists gave form to every object of a, from obsidian arrowheads to fired clay pottery has yielded to complexity and mass production. In our time, the cultural niche for art remains unfilled, while self-expression has become an end in itself. This may not be the healthiest of situations, but then again, no one said we're living the health, in the healthiest of times either. Okay, um, well, that, I'm not going to read another chapter, but, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was, sure, okay. Um, so look at this, it's, it's something happy. <laughs> I'm just going to read a little something from this because, um, of that, um, uh, gray, uh, ending there. So, and also just to introduce this beautiful book. I know it's kind of, it's reversed when I show it like that. But anyway, um, The Journey of Being Human. Is it possible to find real happiness in an ordinary life? By Osho. I'm going to read the introduction and then I'm going to beep, and close the video. <laughs> Man is born with an unknown and unknowable potentiality. His original face is not available when he comes into the world. He has to find it. And that's the difference between be a being and a thing. Okay, so I'm not reading the whole introduction because it's quite long. With that, that is the first paragraph. Mm. And I hope you have just like a truly blessed and amazing day. That God is with you, that you feel his presence, that you feel his love. That you tap into that love. And I pray that, that you receive healing. And that you prosper. And that a prayer gets answered. And that you notice that. And that you feel inspired today to do something for somebody else. An act of kindness. And to just remember to love one another. And treat other, one another with kindness. And um, listen. <laughs> Ciao.